sorry about that. Um, we've just created a different session as the other one timed out after half an hour. And I'll just be adding Asifa back in. There you are. Yeah. Hello, can you see and hear me okay? You're on. I'm on, okay. There I am, yes. Okay, let's see what happens. Yes, they can see you. So yes, you can talk. Oh, okay, brilliant. Sorry about that, guys. I don't know what happened. Suddenly it just literally just vanished. Um, I think Crowdcast can be a little bit finicky, but um, I will just uh, literally carry on where I uh, left off and hopefully you, you can edit everything all together. Um, but I will just uh, carry on. Thank you. You're welcome. So yes, it can be very difficult very uh, distressing um, and it can be very heavy on your mental health when you're navigating uh, a new HIV diagnosis, uh, a new HIV diagnosis, new medication, understanding your status, how that will impact you, any partners, any future partners, um, and also explaining that to uh, somebody whose English may not be great as well. Um, we obviously have, within the South Asian queer community, we obviously have girls, boys. We also have non-binary people, trans people, people that don't um, identify within the gender. They identify beyond the gender. Now, when I was a gay man, I used the pronouns he, him. Uh, obviously, now that I've transitioned and I'm trans um, gender, I use the pronouns she and her. Um, it's taken my family quite a bit of time to get used to that, especially, you know, uh, the South Asian languages are so gendered, you know, uh, especially when we talk to, to people, they are so, so gendered. Uh, Urdu, for example, Hindi, Punjabi, so, so gendered. So it's difficult uh, for people to get their head around that. So with my family, I'm very patient. I, I don't sort of, um, you know, go to their neck every time they they misgender me or dead name me but i'm i'm absolutely fine with that and for those of you who do not know do not know what dead naming is dead naming is when you refer to somebody uh with their birth name with the name they were given at birth rather than the name they are so my birth name was uh, asif and my name is sifa so um you know some relatives if they call me asif they're dead naming me but again it's a journey for everyone so i don't always um jump uh uh to anyone's necks um i think um different people from within the queer community will use different pronouns whether it's within the binary of he him she her or whether it's beyond the binary of they and them. Um, the best advice I can give is never to assume um, 
anyone's gender identity, even when it's obvious, just, you know, start with referring to them as they, um, or ask people how they want to be referred to, and they will tell you. Um, it's better to uh, ask, but if you're afraid to ask, or you're afraid in the world that we live in that people will be offended, then ju just refer to them as they or them. Uh, it's better that way. Um, being transgender in the South Asian world is very different to being gay or bisexual, simply because I think um, the Desi trans community has been so visible around the world and even in the homelands for centuries. Um, you know, if we go back to pre-colonial times before Britain colonialized India uh, and before partition, um, you know, trans people were very much seen as artists and quite rena renowned people and uh, the British quite couldn't understand the third gender and non-binariness and imposed laws, penal codes, that uh, are still very much part of uh, Commonwealth countries today. Uh, India obviously decriminalized that penal code in 2018, so it's legal to be LGBT in um, uh, in India. Socially, it's a different thing, obviously. And then uh, in Pakistan, in uh, Bangladesh, uh, it's still illegal to be LGB. It's legal in all the South Asian countries to be transgender, which is very, very interesting. It harks back to, you know, pre-colonial times and um, the visibility of trans people, you know, out on the streets, begging, dancing, or, you know, in higher positions uh, when it comes to work. So, um, yes, my, I mean, transitioning um, around the world is very difficult because, you know, hormone therapy has all sorts of um, mood swings, has all sorts of, um, you know, ups and downs. It's like going on a roller coaster. It's like going for a second puberty again, which it is. Um, your body changes, your, you know, as you go along, some people like to um you know go from binary to binary where one day they want to be referred to as he another day she another day they depending on where they are on their journey and how they're looking and how they're feeling um and in the uk there's a lot of support but there's a long 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 waiting list you know it's four years um maybe even five now with the pandemic to be seen for your first appointment in the uk uh, and that's just your first appointment. So, you know, with trans people, a lot of people are self-medicating. A lot of people um, may be doing, you know, illegal work or, you know, working in um, sex work, for example, um, in order to fund both uh, their lives and, and their medication. Um, and, um, you know, and also navigating being Asian around that as well, especially coming from, you know, impoverished um, communities. I found that in the UK, a lot of trans people um, have come from overseas. So a lot of asylum seekers are trans or, or non-binary, uh, many more than British born, which is interesting. Um, during my time at NAS, during my 10 years at NAS, I, um, dealt with a lot of um, honor killings, a lot of forced marriages, um, referring people into, you know, counseling and mental health, running support groups myself uh, for, for men and women and, and trans people. Um, and what I found was using a mixture of techniques from the West and the East and, you know, using as much of my bilingual skills as possible. You know, luckily I spoke Urdu and Punjabi and using Hindustani, which, you know, incorporates everyone, um, I, I got through to a lot of people. And um, I think, you know, I think one of the main reasons why I'm talking to you today is essentially to give you advice and to give you tips on how to uh, deal with supporting the LGBTQ South Asian community around the world when it comes to um, their mental health and, and their life's journey. And the first thing I'll say is, it's interesting because, you know, a lot of 
therapists, a lot of us, you know, social workers and support workers, we're taught very much um, with Western ideals and Western theories and Western ways of working. And, you know, I, I found during my work, I was given the freedom to create my own model of working. And what worked was using the best of both worlds. Um, and what I mean by that is, um, as well as keeping professional boundaries, and as well as, um, you know, supporting people through the, the you know, the, um, the Western theories that we're taught through, is to also include language, to include terminology from the motherland and be extra uh, vigilant uh, in holding someone's hand, not literally as in, as in emotionally and through uh, the work that we do. So, you know, South Asian people statistically do not um, seek support um, when it comes to uh, mental health and the lower proportion that choose to um, you know, engage with support services mostly come at crisis points. Unlike our white counterparts, uh, Black and Asian minority communities always come at point of crisis. Never when, you know, there are alarm bells coming or leading up to the point. It's mostly always when things are literally falling apart. So in your first session, what I would say is understand the person. Talk to them about pronouns, first of all, how they would like to be referred, whether that's he, she, they, whether that's even um, by not their name, by a different name. And that's OK. Like, uh, you know, when I worked at NAS, we had the open policy as please give your name. It can be your name. It doesn't have to be your name, but just a name and a number we can contact you on. And if that's not an issue, if that's an issue, then that's they don't have to give any contact details. So it's just being much more open, I guess, in many ways. Uh, understand their gender expression, understand how they want to be referred to, what name they want, might want to be referred to, what language they speak, maybe, if possible, link them up with somebody that speaks the language. If not, then the closest match. Um, and if not, then a South Asian person that just does English and can understand the language. Sometimes, I mean, we had counsellors that for example, didn't speak Gujarati, but understood Gujarati. So if the person, the client or the service user was speaking Gujarati, it was fine because it was understood, but the, re the response back would be in English. And that was fine as well. Um, you know, terminology like Khwajasara, like Hijra, like Devdasi, like um, Avaranasi. Um, there's so many Koti. Uh, there's different types of terminology in the different regions. Um, there are, there are, there's so much. And, and what I'd say is, just read up on it. You know, I know um, a brown therapist, in, for example, has a great glossary and great terminology. And what I'd say is just be open to these terms. Many terms that therapists and brown people have heard left, right and center in all sorts of circumstances but be ready to use them. Also, please check your privilege. Most, I'm sure most brown therapists will be heterosexual and there's nothing wrong in that. Be proud of your heterosexuality. I certainly am. Um, and those of you that I'm trying to play here on gender expression and, and sexual expression here. I'm a trans woman who identifies as heterosexual because I like guys. So that's something to throw out in the mix. So check your privilege. As South Asian heterosexual people, we've grown up with the theory that being LGBT is wrong. Being queer is wrong, it's anti-Asian, it's anti-religious. So first of all, check our own prejudices, check our own prejudice and our own privilege. It's privilege to be heterosexual. It's privilege to be a South Asian man in the, in the South Asian community. If you're going to be counselling or giving group therapy to a subsection, a minority, a minority that is, you know, oppressed, uh, a minority that is erased, a minority that is persecuted, 
maybe talk to your seniors, talk to your um, managers uh, and have sessions on your own, maybe one-to-ones with each other, maybe get some extra training around decoding your own privilege. Because how can you, if you're carrying that, how can you support someone without really understanding the nuances? And that's really, I mean, it's a bold thing for me to say, but as a person who received, um, you know, counseling from a South Asian queer person who spoke a mother language, it changed the course of my life. Because had that not happened, I would have ended up married to my first cousin leading a very miserable double life. Um, My wife would be absolutely miserable. My kids would be absolutely miserable. Um, In order for me to please my mom and dad and my community, uh, my mom and dad probably, you know, although they're alive, they won't be alive in in 20 years and I'll be left with everything because I didn't take that step and because I wasn't supported properly. So please understand your privilege check it, um, challenge it, really challenge it. You know, using words like hijra, koti, gandu, all sorts of, you know, derogatory words, which as South Asian queer people, we own, we own those words. Very much like in the West, faggot or batty boy or or gay or queer is very much being owned because we're not going to be suppressed. We're not going to be victimized. Um, uh, And lastly, um, you know, South Asian people on the whole, forget queer communities, are notorious at being late, are notorious at timekeeping, are notorious at fallout rates. You know, they, they may not complete 12 sessions. You'll be lucky maybe if you get three. So it's understanding and staying obviously within the boundaries. If somebody's given an hour and they're late by half an hour, they're only going to get 20 minutes or so or whatever. That's fine. But understand that that person may need a bit more um, than just that hour um, and try and find some sort of flexibility um, around that. Uh, Not immediately on the day, but maybe after that. Maybe a lot of follow up and support work needs to be done. There is a high rate of suicide and self-harm within the South Asian queer community. Um, There was one point in my life when I um, nearly committed suicide, when I saw nothing beyond that engagement. And it's only when my lecturer, um, uh, sorry, it gets me super emotional at the best of times. It's only when my lecturer Um, made an intervention in my life. And this is a white guy, a white middle-aged gay man. It made an intervention in my life and it changed my life. It made me feel alive again Uh, because a few few days earlier than that intervention, um, I was ready to jump into the River Thames like many of the Bollywood heroines I'd seen growing up. And I can laugh about it now But those were my reference points. Those were my like, you know, that's what I grew up with. Oh, you know, Bollywood films where the heroine can't marry the guy. So she's got to commit suicide. And, you know, watching films like Nuri or Sita or Gita, that's what happened. So, um, yes, there are high rates of suicide. There are high rates of self-harm. And that's something to deal with in the sense that have very robust uh, referral pathways, have really good links to, you know, local social services, uh, hospitals, for example. Um, A great way that, you know, we did work at NAS was um, as a South Asian support worker for for gay men in particular, I made links with all the um, hospitals, especially in the heavy Uh, South Asian populated areas of London, made myself available and even had outreach posts there so that I could be available for anyone who was newly coming in, self-harming, newly coming in, getting tested. um, And it just worked. And once you do the, you know, another problem may be getting people through the the door. Once you set up those um, pathways of trust and people begin to really trust you, 
um, it's a snowball effect in the South Asian community. Uh, it got to a point, you know, especially in the last five years uh, of my work at NAS, where we'd have to have massive waiting lists, turn people away that would win because it got to a point where we couldn't handle it. And that's not only a success of the service, but it's also a sign of how much is needed out, out there. Yes, the, our communities are very much underground, but there is so much a need out there. And when you do make yourself visible uh, around the, the South Asian queer uh, topic um, and support, then people will begin to trust you. Um, the other thing we'll urge everyone is um, it's Pride Month and happy Pride. Um, and, um, you know, I know uh, this is being pre recorded because a small number of people um, uh, came to watch me today, which is, I, I value that. Thank you so much. But generally, if as a whole worldwide community, if we're not going to support our South Asian queer people, like attending things like this, like really taking on stuff like this, then really is the future. And that's really what I mean by checking our privileges and um, really making a goal of supporting our um, minority community. You know, India has decriminalized. There's a lot of stuff going on in India around pride, around, um, you know, I know there's so many Bollywood films that are now going to be coming out in the next few years around the, the subject. I actually took part in one, so I can't wait for it to be released. Um, and um, it's inevitable that with evolution, this is just a time bubble ticking off. As in, you know, if in the West, we're just getting to grips with transgenderism, which in the East we've known for centuries, and in the East, they're just getting used to LGBT-ness, and in the West, you know, we've come all this way with laws. It's only a matter of time that, you know, as the world goes on, things will evolve. Islam, many of our religions have evolved with time. Asians, uh, South Asians living overseas have evolved with time and taken on a lot of their Britishness, Canadianness, Americanness, whatever. And even the newer generation in Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, are really moving forward. Generation Z, for example, I find that younger people are much more inclined to challenge, um, whether it's around human rights, women's rights, LGBTness, mental health, disabilities. Um, there's a brighter, bolder future out there. But I guess we all have to do our own bit in order to make that future brighter. I find that many people say, you know what, um, you know, if their children ask them, for example, mum and dad, what would you say or do if, um, you know, I came out as gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender? And I know many Asian parents, they, especially, um, you know, British Asian parents, uh, second or third generation, they will say, do you know what, I, it, it, it's, it's going to be challenging, it's going to be tough, um, but I'd rather you be yourself and I'd, I'd rather accept you uh, and help you you know, face the challenges against the community than, than turn you away or disown you, which is what the first generation would have done. But at the same time, in the back of their mind, they have an afterthought, which is, which is please don't be gay, please don't be Asian, please don't be bisexual, transgender. Um, and that's simply because, you know, as a parent, they don't want their child to go through the trauma, the challenges that come with being their C and um, queer. And that in itself is a microaggression and something that needs to be checked because it's different once someone within your own family or your own child comes out. People's perceptions change very quickly, I can assure you. And that, my um, darlings, if I can call you, uh, is it from me. I hope uh, what I want you to take away is that you can really cause change uh, in people's lives, in people from your community. Um, you also have uh, a real opportunity to educate yourself, others uh, from within the mental health community, uh, within the therapy community, and also within the South Asian uh, community as well. Um, and lastly, 
my story is my story and it links to so many other people uh, from you know the South Asian community, South Asian queer community, my parents, my family. And by doing small things every day, by putting small drops into the ocean that create small ripples, you can cause change and you can better someone's life. So don't be afraid to drip, drip, drip away into other people's lives. And thank you for watching this and for taking the opportunity to change people's lives. Hi, Asifa. It's Tina. Hello, Tina. How are you? Long time no see. <laughs> oh, it's so lovely to see you. I am full of hay fever, hence my face looks like this. Oh, and you know, my daughter I mean, you look just... fine. You oh, look fine. thank you. My daughter just came on, came and saw your face, and she says, "Mummy, her makeup is so beautiful." Well, she... What is your daughter's name? Never. She's gone upstairs now. She's gone for a bath. <laughs> Is, but she was in oh, Nirvani, yeah. Nirvani. If, you, if Nirvani ever wants her makeup done, she's more She than knows where husband. she's going. Yeah, <laughs> she will be definitely coming to you for makeup tips. But I've just got to say, Asifa, I mean, I know you and I know the work that you've done. But this talk for me, as a psychologist who works within the community, but also is now coming up with clients who do talk about their sexuality, is something that I feel like we need. Now, as a, as a therapist, I didn't get any training around this. Mm -hmm. So yeah. this is why I feel like we have to take it upon ourselves to do this work. And I'm so glad that you are helping us to, first of all, dissect and understand the history behind, you know, what the community has gone through and is going through, but also to share your personal story as well. So I, I thank you so much for doing that because, you know, we relate to stories. We connect yes. our understanding to stories. Yes. And that's how we learn. That's how we see the human, you know, beyond the stats and the figures. Yes. That's where we see the human. So I'm, I, I just want to say thank you for, for doing this for us for a start. Now, I've got a few questions that, you know, um, we were kind of trying to think about in relation to the talk that you had. And the point that you made was how South Asians actually come when it is crisis point. And I know this as a therapist that often people come when it's just at that point where you're like, it, everything's gone wrong. Yeah. How do we as therapists help, um, you know, the LGBT community to feel supported and visible and cared for um, before they get to that point? What, what is it that we could be doing as therapists? It's interesting because obviously as therapists, you can only have an intervention when that person literally is referred into you or comes to your door. Now, before then, I think the best thing you can do is literally advert, um, send yourself out there into the world. You know, advertisements, um, uh, maybe also uh, a lot of outreach if uh, in the sense that, you know, whether it's to community groups, whether it's to community centres or whether it's women's groups, whether it's, you know, mosques, for example. I mean, it, at NAS, we used to do a lot of work within mosques, temples, good waters, and it was always under the health banner. So mm. it was never literally sexual health or, or mental health. It was always health, whether you know, that's linking up with, um, you know, getting your BP read, getting your blood sugar tested, seeing, you know, if there's any uh, interventions around mental health, da, 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 da. So it's, it's about working holistically outside the bubble because, you know, before crisis points, it's drilled into us as, as South Asians that we shouldn't air out our dirty laundry. You know, even though we consider it dirty laundry, it might not even be dirty laundry, but we shouldn't air it out to others, let alone another, you know, South Asian person in private. So it's literally about building trust. And, you know, I'm in my work, 
now as a drag queen and also previously as a support worker, it was very much being hands on. Uh, I understand obviously the barriers around uh, being a therapist, but a lot of stuff can be done you know, externally within outreach programs, using the internet, for example. Um, it's just about getting into the right um, spaces and gaining that trust, whether it's, you know, internationally, whether it's literally on the ground within certain cities or certain countries. It's just unfortunately doing that legwork to start with. Yeah. And the second question I had is, you know, you made a really interesting point around how, the, you know, the parents response to their child who may come out. And, you know, I, I'd like to think of myself as somebody who is going to be supportive or open and, you know, all those things that, you know, you were saying that, you know, that second or third generation parent. What do we I mean, as as a community of parents, I think this is a really key issue that how do we start to have these conversations, you know, in in almost to, to show our acceptance and to almost educate parents of this generation, second, third generation, that, mm. you know, how we can support our children should they, you know, come out as gay or, or not in, in, in just in support and in general, I guess, because, you know, one of the things I'm quite passionate about is for my children is, you know, we talk about, um, you know, racism, we talk about colorism, obviously in a, mm -hmm. a child friendly yeah. manner. I yeah. think that the conversations around, you know, the LGBT community has to be started very, very early as well. S starting from, I know we started having conversations about, you know, my daughter asked, can men carry men marry men? I was, yes, of course they can. And, you know, I feel like that we have these conversations when we see things on the television and mm. it's about normalizing it. But mm. I guess this is not, you know, I, I may be the exception to the rule here, but mm. we've, how do we support other South Asian parents? And also, you know, it's not just the parents, it's also the grandparents as well. How do we start those conversations around normalizing you know this these these conversations for, in general how do we even start god what a what a question to ask i mean uh, an answer as well because that that is literally the crux of this isn't it yeah if everyone had that million dollar potion or whatever this is literally it so i mean first things first let me tackle that that thing about our own internalized you know prejudices for example yeah. so you know when i first realized who i was I instantly said, oh my gosh, this is wrong. This is against my culture. This is against my religion. It's there. And I don't want parents to think, oh my gosh, like um, just because I have this thought, I'm such a bad person. You're not, it's just, it's, it's your afterthought. It's just something that's there, that's generational, that's, you know, something that's just already there. Mm -hmm. And it's just about challenging that and you know, going back to your question, it's very much about starting a conversation. And these days, when I talk to people, for example, uh, whether it's in my family, whether it's in, you know, other, um, whether it's friends, whether it's friends of my mum's, for example, or friends of friends, I tend to go and use a lot of material. So, for example, and there's not a lot of material out there with, you know, positive, uh south asian lgbt representation so for example i know that amir khan did a, like an hour-long um uh, program on indian television around homosexuality which was positively received it was in hindi and uh, i managed to uh, get a copy of it uh, a year or so like a few years ago and then last year i don't know what happened but i've uh, uh, accidentally erased it and i need to get it back but I use that as a, as a starting point because, you know, for Bollywood lovers, Amir Khan is really respected. And you have a person um, within, you know, who's the same color as you, same background as you, talking about this. And it's a starting point. You know, whether it's, you know, whether it's going to, I don't know, one of your, uh, I remember when I first came out, I was taken to the GP, my doctor. And my doctor was, I had two Asian doctors, uh, Dr. Singh, Dr. Patel, both Hindu. Um, and they specifically said to my mom and dad, look, this, there's nothing that we can prescribe to your son. Um, he is who he is. 
Um, we understand the issues around Islam, but you know, this is something that you're going to have to deal with as a family, you're gonna to have to talk about, you're gonna to have to come to some sort of resolution, you know, if you want to, if you want Asif to remain within the family. And for my parents, it was very much like, we want you to remain, we don't want you to go. Because going back to the whole, um, you know, we are a family block. We, you know, as a son at the time, we need you for money. We need, you know, we need you for support. Um, I was the only son at the time. So, um, you know, it was very much about um, talking, keeping that dialogue going. And over time, it's, it's built with trust and acceptance. But, it's a long road. There is no straightforward answer, unfortunately, Tina, because every family is different because, you know, some of us are Bengali, some of us are Gujarati, some of us are Hindu, some of us are, you know, some of us are Hindu Gujarati, some of us are Punjabi uh, um, um, uh, um, Hindu. We, some of us worship different gods, for example. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a difficult one because each family and each person coming out or each parents each set of parents will know the best of how to deal with their family it's just i think what works what has worked for me is making sure that that figure of authority whether it's a doctor whether it's you know something that amir khan has said whether you know it's positive um gay asian imagery i even like my mom said like a couple of years ago when pakistan had its first transgender newsreader. She told me, she was like, oh my gosh, uh, go on the internet. There's this beautiful lady, she's reading the news. She's so like, her Urdu is impeccable. Because in, in Pakistan, if, you, if you're a newsreader, your Urdu needs to be like RP level of, of English, for example, it needs to be like up there. So, you know, I managed to look it up. I managed to see the YouTube clip, read all about her because it went viral. So it's just having those, reference points, I guess, and going, look, this is what's happening. And, you know, I don't want you right now to think it's right or wrong or agree or disagree with it. I just want to have a conversation with you about it. Yeah, that's it's just really about powerful. taking that on it. It's just about having that courage and that honesty just to have that honest uh, conversation about it. Mm. And I think for many families, that probably is doable. But then there obviously are other families that just it it's it's just not doable, and you know that that's for many historic reasons that could have happened in the past. Whatever we don't know, like you said, every family is different. Yes. But I, you know, one thing that I do that resonated with me was the ability to just stay open, but also to have those reference points. And I love that because I think that's what is missing. Yeah, is that we need to see more representative we need to see more asifas you know and much more representation especially i mean it's, it's hard enough to try and find a brown person on the television as it is exactly yeah yes. so the more we see this in bollywood the more that we see this within mainstream television the more that we 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 can see representation and we can see positive re representation yes that's essentially what we need and to show how, you know, I think I was speaking to somebody only just this morning and they were someone of um, a medical profession and they were talking about their own experiences as a gay Muslim person. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, they openly talk about that. They share that. And I think that that's really powerful because you're right that there's something about having people who are in um, professional spaces or who have authority or authority figures and that can talk from, again, that perspective is so helpful because I think South Asians tend to look up to doctors and, you know, yes. senior figures and, and go, oh, right, so if the doctor says so, okay, then, you know, so yes. there is something around that, definitely. Okay, I'm just going to check and see if I've got any more questions. Bear with me. Um, okay, so this question's a, a bit of a big, big question. Um, mm. How do we get... Um, queer people to address their internalized homophobia? That's a massive question, isn't it? God, yes. I mean, you know, for me personally, it, it was literally unpacking years and years of held beliefs, of, you know, moral codes, uh, structures just within uh, that were set up for me by life. Um, I was personally heavily bullied at school under Section 28 
which was, you know, a Thatcherite law which prohibited uh, the promotion of homosexuality at schools. So at the time, like, the teachers couldn't even support me or, you know, it was very, very difficult. So I, had, I didn't realise until I got, until I came out and unpacked that, unpacked, you know, um, my... Um, <laughs> my internalized homophobia and how, you know, how I saw myself and this idea of pride. Um, because as, as, as we're not taught to be proud um, as Asians, we're only really taught to be proud as Asians if we achieve something big. So whether that's being a doctor, a lawyer, uh, whether that's going into medicine, whether that's, dry, you know, flying a big plane, there's certain things in the Asian world where you are allowed to be proud because you've achieved such and such and it's all by achievement but if you um you know if you're taking on all these prejudices um really i'll be honest the only way you can really unpack it is by therapy um and is by facing up to all those heartaches all those traumas all those phobias um and all those fears that you have really and that's again you know what i was talking about in the talk about hand holding about going that extra mile um and lit i don't mean literal hand holding but what i mean by it is that bame communities south asian communities in particular we need that extra hand holding and that extra massage if you like because of all these traumas and added things that come with being South Asian. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly because, you know, I think that there's, you, you kept referencing to it, the language aspect, and this isn't just mm. literal language. I think it's like reference points. So my experience of working within, within our community is using, um, the language of, say, if I'm working with somebody who is younger, using the language of a younger person, you yes. know, if there was a, a particular slang word that would be used, I'd reference that and we'd use that, we'd explore that, we'd, we'd kind of use that within the therapeutic context. And similarly, with somebody who is older, I would try and find a, a frame of reference, like you said, like you reference the old Bollywood yes. movies, you know, if that's their thing, you, you go and do the research, you go and find out a little bit about the, the types of messages or the music or whatever. And I think that's crucial because in order for people to feel connected to somebody else, there needs to be some sort of common ground. And that's exactly what you're talking about. And, yes. you know, I do this even, even if it is, is a white client or a black client, I try and find what is their thing? What is their thing that, you know, kind of makes them float, makes them feel like it helps them to make sense of the world, be it music, art, literature, films, whatever and yeah. if we can do that we can we can kind of connect to them on a different level yes i just want to say a huge thank you for for this wonderful talk and i really hope that those people who do um watch this conversation is really about helping us to start somewhere and what you've done in this um talk is you've given us your your lived experience, but also your professional experience. Um, and I feel like I've learned so much in this very short space of time that you've offered us today. So thank you so much, Asifa, for joining us. And if people can or want to continue to connect with you, what are the best ways that they can do that? Firstly, let me thank you as well, because you've created this massive space and massive platform, um, which is much needed. But obviously, as brown people, we always have to take the initiative to set things up that aren't there. Um, and I know it takes a lot of hard work. So thank you for having me, but also thank you for taking on this much needed uh, initiative. Um, and if people want to follow me and find out more about me, um, my handles uh, on social media are at Asifa Lahore, or my website is asifalahore.co.uk. Well, that's everything for today. So thank you so much, Asifa. And hopefully we will catch you on the next event. So take care, Asifa. Have a good evening. Bye.
Thank you. And take care, everyone. Bye.